Thanks, Fraser. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my immense pleasure to welcome you back to the City Chambers for this year's Jim Reed Memorial Lecture. I know this is a highlight of the Jim Reed Foundation's public calendar. I assure you it is an important one in the life of this building too, as the City takes its opportunity to honour a man of great principle, integrity, charisma and passion. These are extraordinary times and that is reflected in tonight's subject, the cost of living crisis. There can be no doubt that that is a topic that would have exercised, perhaps infuriated, but most importantly motivated Jimmy Reid. He believed in justice and fairness, but also in the skills, the pride and the dignity of his colleagues and his neighbours. His conviction <coughs> and his moral courage served him, his brothers and sisters and his community well. Through the Jim Reed Foundation, his legacy for Glasgow and for the whole of Scotland, those values are preserved and continue to serve us all. Okay. They are ideas and principles that are threatened by the current crisis. But I am sure that following Jimmy's example, we will also hear tonight about how dire events can also be the catalyst for change, about the importance of quality of life, learning and culture, and their power to transform our society, our work and our daily lives. It's my privilege to welcome this year's guest speaker. Like Jimmy Reid, She's a native of Glasgow, having worked as a housing officer before becoming a trade union official. Today, she's the first woman to lead the country's biggest trade union. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the General Secretary of Unison, Christina McInerney. Thank you. Thank you. Use your feedback. My name is Lily Mason, I'm the convener for Eunice in Scotland and it's my privilege to welcome you here tonight to hear um, an inspirational woman who is the General Secretary of Unison. I never get tired of hearing the first female General Secretary <laughs> of the biggest trade union in the UK. start by um, colleagues just welcoming you all here tonight but paying a special giving a special welcome we're very privileged this evening to have members of the Reid family uh, joining us this evening so I do want to thank our, the Reid family for giving up their time and joining us this evening thank you Welcome Christina's family. So the front <laughs> row, I think it's the first front two rows. Um, I think there's a big crowd, she brought it all herself. Uh, Christina's family is with us this evening and they've travelled far and wide. We've got a niece from America, another niece that's come from Belgium, others from all <laughs> over the country. Um, Robert, Christina's husband, is with us. Christina's two children. Uh, Natasha and Michael are here as well, and also Margaret, who's Christina's um, favourite sister, <laughs> and our brother John and their wider families are here this evening. So I would like us to welcome Christina's family this evening. <laughs> Let 
me also start by um, just uh, saying a few words about the foundation. I'm one of the trustees of the charity, the Jimmy Reid Foundation Charity, and I am absolutely privileged to be asked to address you this evening on behalf of the charity and also to give you just a little insight into what it is that we do as uh, the charity. Um, we founded in 2011, we've done so many uh, different activities around in Jimmy's name and the great man's name, the think tank that's been established to take forward the fantastic work that we all know and love and hopefully <coughs> we can as a foundation replicate that, grow from that and learn from that and make sure that our communities in the future uh, are represented and safe. The Chief Officer of the Foundation will say a few words at the end in recognition of the work of the Foundation. But just to say that this is the 50th year anniversary. Um, we have been slightly curtailed by something called COVID in terms of our organising around that. But we did do a number of online events and they were very widely received, very welcomely received. And uh, colleagues in the room, I'm sure, took some time to participate in those. Can I just say a few words about my sister, Christina McInerney, uh, the first woman general secretary. I'm going to say it again. It's not the last time you're going to hear it. Um, uh, of, Christina was elected in uh, January of 2021 following an all-members ballot. Now, there were four candidates in that ballot. Christina was the only female candidate in the ballot, and she returned uh, a, 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 on a 47.7% of the vote. So a, a, a fantastic mandate for Katrina Salida Union. She was born, I'm going to say the year, Christina, you can kick me later, it's on my scripts, I'm saying it. She was born in 1958 and grew up in Trapo in Glasgow. After leaving school at 16, she worked in a number of areas. She worked for the civil service, she worked for the NHS and in retail before going to Strathclyde University uh, and studying English and history. She worked in Glasgow City, as the Lord Provost said, as a housing officer and she worked for the uh, City Council before moving to her first job as a trade union official to the GMB, but I'm not holding that against her. <laughs> she then moved to Nalgo, which then merged with Cozy and Yuppie to become Unison. Christina has done a number of significant roles within Unison, and I first met Christina about 15 years ago when I was chair of our health service group executive, and Christina moved in to be the secretary of health. And working with Christina in health, work, watching, uh, learning from Christina over those years has been uh, absolutely amazing uh, for me in my career as a Unison activist. Christina has also worked as a secretary in education. She's also worked as a lead uh, negotiator in bargaining negotiations and equalities throughout the whole of our union and was a, a senior negotiator for many disputes and has led on many disputes uh, throughout the UK, both in local government and health and the wider sector. Christina has led at the front, continues to lead from the front, and I'm sure you'll agree, um, a fantastic advocate for women's rights and women in our movement. She's done a fantastic job. After leaving school, she became very interested in politics and uh, she, Christina in her speech will uh, obviously reference her inspiration, the great man himself, uh, Jimmy Reid, but she uh, joined the Communist Party in 1974 uh, and, and attended the Socialist uh, School, Sunday School and sell copies of the Mormon Star outside the Mary Hill Lockwood <laughs> Social Club. That's Christina's political education. And it doesn't get much better than that. Um, she joined the Labour Party and is still a member of the Labour Party now. But during COVID, Christina took over at a time and, and through that election process, Christina is one of the lead negotiators during COVID, led from the front, led on PPE, led on health and safety, led on making sure that our workplaces were safe and our workers were safe. And that, for me, is a real testament to the power that is that woman, Christina McInerney. Can I just welcome Christina and can I ask you to join me in welcoming our first female <laughs> General Secretary of Unison, Christina McInerney. <laughs> Uh, thank 
Thank you, Lillian. Uh, it's a bit of a mutual appreciation society tonight because uh, Lillian's not only just the, uh, the, just, I don't mean just, she's not the, the convener for Sc Unison in Scotland, but she's actually chair of our, the, the national conveners group across all of our 12 regions. And she's an incredibly powerful woman in our union. Uh, you know, when, 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 when Lillian says jump, people say how high. Uh, so I, I'm honored to count her as a friend and she's been a great support to me and inspiration to me. And if ever there's any difficult issues, I always go to Lillian and that, that will still be the case. Um, now, I don't know if Lillian mentioned this, but um, I'm the first woman general. <laughs> uh, can I just say I am deeply honoured to be here uh, and I want to thank uh, Gregor, Bob, Lynn and Lillian and the entire Jimmy Reid Foundation for the invitation to this. I was so excited when it came through. And it's a huge privilege to be here in my hometown honouring one of Glasgow's finest heroes and in one of these the most amazing building in the city. And, and I'm especially proud, as Lillian said, to be here in the presence of members of the Reid family, his daughter and his granddaughter, and of course the friends and comrades who knew him well and were part of that historic struggle to save shipbuilding in Glasgow. And not just the shipbuilding, but to save the livelihoods of workers, families, and communities who depended on it. I think it was in, in about 1973-74 when I walked into the Glasgow City Halls, not far from here, to hear Jimmy speak in the flesh. The hall was packed to the rafters. Uh, I was about 15 and I went with my older sister and her husband, Margaret and Buff Baxter, who are here tonight. They were both members of the Communist Party and knew Jimmy personally. They campaigned for him when he stood for Parliament and together we went up and sat in the gallery to listen to him give his speech. And he spoke for probably well over an hour, uh, but the time passed in a flash and he didn't have any notes, at least as far as I can remember. He walked up and down the stage, he talked eloquently and with great passion and his deep resonant voice that I've never forgotten filled the entire hall. He spoke about how new technology needed to be harnessed to benefit everyone, to give people more leisure time, to free them from the daily toil of working just to live. And as he put in his famous 1972 Glasgow University address, let us gear our society to social need, not personal greed. I was utterly inspired by him. So much so that when he'd finished uh, speaking, as Lillian said, I joined the Communist Party on the spot. There were recruiters walking around the hall uh, with application forms ready to sign up, awestruck lead, uh, listeners like me. Uh, and uh, you know, I just think, great recruiting tactics, we're going to learn from them. <laughs> uh, Jimmy remains one of the best speakers I've ever heard. He spoke passionately about injustice. But he, and his belief in the inherent goodness of people. Despite his awareness of the obstacles that had to be overcome, he was optimistic about the future. His was a message of hope, a message he carried throughout his life. To a teenager like me, uh, who grew up in Drumchapel, close to the Clyde, where almost everyone's family had a connection to shipbuilding, the Upper Clyde shipbuilder struggle was in everyone's lips. We spoke about it on the street, we spoke about it in school, we talked about it everywhere. And if the shipyards had closed down then, that would have devastated an already struggling community. So that day after I, I heard Jimmy's speech, I left Glasgow City Halls with no clear idea of what I wanted to be. I didn't walk out thinking, one day I'm gonna be leader of, of a trade union. I didn't even walk out thinking, I want to work for a trade union. But thanks to Jimmy's words, I did walk out thinking about what matters in life. His words and his message were so clear. Poverty is a choice made by the powerful. It's not inevitable and we can do something about it. And to achieve that, we need to unleash everyone's potential to improve their chances of leading a fulfilling and productive life. Because as Jimmy put it so powerfully, the untapped resources of the North Sea are as nothing compared to the untapped resources of the great mass of our people who go through life without even a glimmer 
of what they could have contributed to their fellow human beings. And my parents' lives were great examples of why Jimmy's vision matters so much. Both born in Glasgow, in the Garn Gad area, again, not far from here, as it was then known. They spent their childhood in poor quality tenements, hastily cobbled together to house incoming workers. And a heavy cloud of polluted air apparently always sat over the Garn Gad. And history records the Garn Gad slums as among the worst in Europe. By the age of eight, my mother was an orphan. Both her parents had died by diseases brought on by poverty. And she and her two brothers grew up in orphanages and foster homes. And my father was the youngest of 17 children. He was a bright child. He was the ducks of his primary school. And he could have done anything. But when he turned 14, his education came to an abrupt end as he had to leave school to bring in money to the family. He turned 18 in August 1939, just as the Second World War was breaking out, and he'd already joined the army. And he didn't get home until 1946, when he was 25. And by then he was too old to start an apprenticeship, so he spent the, le the rest of his working life as a labourer. My mother always worked too, usually in cleaning or catering jobs, or latterly in shops. Both my parents left school with no qualifications, but they were clever, articulate, incredibly well-read people with a keen interest in politics and world affairs. And the sad and frustrating thing for me and my family is that we have no doubt that given different opportunities in life, they could have achieved anything they wanted. But I'm not here to tell you the story of my life. I just wanted you to understand why Jim, what Jimmy said about unleashing everyone's potential has always resonated with me. Even now, opportunities for working class people are still far from what they should be. Life chances are still limited by class, by income, by gender, <coughs> by race, by disability. And I see the same thing every single day in my, in my job as General Secretary of Unison and in the many years as a negotiator. I saw employers, governments, the media constantly undermining people and underestimating people, equating low, P, sorry, equating low pay and a lack of formal qualifications with low intelligence and low ambition. And nothing, nothing could be further from the truth. I'm going to digress a minute. I see looking around this room tonight, I see people I know well from Unison who don't do particularly well-paid jobs, do incredibly important jobs, and who are incredibly clever, articulate, well-read people, and that I see them every single day. So this has been a driver throughout my life, and it's why after working in several different jobs, I did come to the trade union movement. Jimmy Reid was passionate about fighting inequality, and he was passionate about the power of the collective. And every day in my job, I marvel about what the power of the collective can achieve. Like the fantastic equal pay dispute in Glasgow, a campaign and strategy devised and led by those on strike, 8,000 mostly low paid women. Some of them and the trade union colleagues who worked with them and supported them are here tonight. But we now have the toughest industrial uh, legislation in Europe. And this lot in Westminster are determined to make it even more difficult for us to campaign for better paying conditions for workers and to take strike action, threatening to bring in even more restrictions on the right to strike. Apparently, it's one of Jacob Rees-Mogg's pet projects. Uh, and, you know, it's one of his top priorities because there's nothing else happening in the country, so why not focus on trade unions? Two and a half years ago, when we went into lockdown, it became obvious who were the essential workers? Cleaners, catering staff, refuse collectors, transport and food production staff, delivery drivers, health and care workers, many of them doing jobs you'd never think of. And it's shocking, truly shocking, how quickly they've been forgotten, especially by those in power. Now those same people are being told 
to exercise pay restraint because the country can't afford to give them a pay rise. When the actual truth is, the country can't afford not to give them a pay rise. It's the right and moral thing to do. It's the sensible thing to do. It's how we rebuild communities and revitalise local economies. Because when we give working people a pay rise, they don't invest it, in my experience, in stocks and shares. They don't go and buy a second home. And they're extremely unlikely, I think, to bet on whether the pound is going to fall or rise. They spend it locally, buying shoes for their kids, food in local shops, and taking their family to the local cafe or leisure centre. Giving a pay rise also helps our essential public services at a time when they are literally hemorrhaging staff and morale is rock bottom. But employers don't just hand out pay rises like confetti. Even now, when many employers tell us they're sympathetic to the plight of workers, we still have to negotiate pay rises and sometimes fight tooth and nail for them. And that's what trade unions do. And despite the impact of the pandemic on all of us, the top 10 companies have continued to make huge profits. Energy companies are predicted to make £170 billion in excess profits. The rich have become even richer. Even the chief executive of Shell has told the Tories in Westminster, you need to tax us more. The 10 richest men in the world doubled their income during the two years of the pandemic, doubled their income. A pandemic that has had a disastrous and disproportionate impact on women, black and disabled people in particular. And while poorer nations are still struggling to get vaccines and make any kind of economic recovery, this is economic violence on a global scale. And in the UK, the Westminster government only seems prepared to intervene to help the rich. Their response to the cost of living crisis is to remove the cap on bonus, bankers' bonuses and give tax breaks to the very rich. Although, as we've seen, that was a step too far for even some of their Conservative colleagues and cronies. Although I think they're only hinting that it's, it's been put in a drawer somewhere, not actually ripped up and thrown away. But, they're not but they are cancelling next year's planned increase in corporation tax. They're freezing capital gains tax. Now, the Scottish Government quite rightly said they wouldn't be implementing the tax cuts to the rich. But it too could use more of its powers to raise taxes. They could raise land and business transactions tax especially on second or third homes. Now, the Westminster government will tell us that their tax policy will create wealth. And miraculously, after having failed miserably in the past, trickle-down economics will work its magic. Where have we heard that before? Politicians need to go to places like Drumchapel or Salford or the Welsh Valleys or the Shankill Road or Falls Road in Belfast and talk to the people there and say, how's trickle-down economics working for you then? Now, a few weeks before his first proper meeting with Truss, Pre President Biden tweeted, I am sick and tired of trickle-down economics. It has never worked. Now, we now have a UK Prime Minister who openly states she doesn't believe in redistribution. In her words, we need to grow the cake, not redistribute it. And that's not even true. She clearly does believe in redistribution. But in her version, it's taking money away from the poor to give to the rich. An ideological position that flies in the face of long-term evidence from across the world that shows the more unequal a society is, the more everyone loses out. The reality is income inequality hurts everyone in a country, including the wealthy. And in stark contrast, the more equal a society is, the more likely it is to have good public services and to, 
which in turn produce healthier and happier citizens. So how do we find the money to fund our public services and pay public sector and other workers fairly? I would argue we do this through a fundamental change in how we tax companies and individual wealth. Ensuring that those large multinational companies like Amazon and Google pay their fair share. After all, they depend on staff, their workforce, like warehouse workers, being able to drive on roads that are well paved, having a transport infrastructure where the workers and their families have access to health, to care services and to education. I mean, if an Amazon work, work, a warehouse goes on fire, they expect the local fire service to come and put it out. But they're not paying for that service. We are. And we know this is the worst economic crisis in over a generation. A crisis that's blighting many people's lives. But people are fighting back. In unison, we're running ballots in areas, I have to say, I never thought we would run ballots. We'll be running industrial action ballots in the Environment Agency. That's the group who look after flood defences. Uh, we're running a, a ballot in the Food Standards Agency. And we're in the middle of a dispute in the university sector, some of you may know about it, where porters and administrative staff are standing up for better pay. We've had pickets this week in Glasgow and in Napier in Edinburgh. And just this week, we started our industrial action ballot with our members in the NHS in Scotland. And in a couple of weeks, we start our ballot for NHS workers in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, so across the entire UK. <clears throat> And we're urging all of our members to vote yes in that ballot. But I don't un underestimate the challenge of that. In unison, it means that by November, we'll be balloting around 400,000 NHS workers. That's huge. I don't think any union has balloted that many. It might have, some of us might have done it during the, the pension strike. The sheer logistics of it are massive, especially under the current legislation, and we do face a real challenge in getting out the vote. And of course, if our NHS members vote for strike action, they'll be accused of putting lives at risk. But I've been talking to our members who work in the NHS, the nurses, the ambulance staff, the porters, the cleaners, and they say to me, the service is so bad, it's on its knees at the moment, that going out and strike won't actually make it worse. It will just draw attention to how bad it is. And that's the same across all parts of the UK. But I also say, as the General Secretary of the UK's biggest union, we don't bring our members out to bring down governments. We bring them out to improve their pay and conditions. We bring them out to fight for better investment in public services. We go into disputes to get results and we look to other ways to win. Unite under Sharon Graham and the GMB under Gary Smith and many other mainly private, uh, private sector unions have been very successful in their leveraging campaigns, targeting specific groups, putting pressure on private companies that make huge profits to make them share some of that with the workforce. In the public sector, the challenge is a bit different. We need to put pressure on employers, but critically, we need to put pressure on governments who control the funding. Now, we've been trying to negotiate for several months on local government pay in Scotland, but, but actually, when getting very successful, getting much success from the Scottish Government, but we were forced to take strike action. And then the media focused on the rubbish building up on the streets in Edinburgh during the Edinburgh Festival. Now that was a relatively small number of people going on strike. Unison was due to bring out our schools and early years workers the following week. But that action and the coverage it got 
forced the employers and the Scottish Government to come back and negotiate with us, something they had been resisting up to then. And that new offer has now been accepted by Unison members, by Unite and the GMB. And I want to pay tribute to the trade union negotiators in that dispute for holding their nerve and forcing the Scottish Government and COSLA to put more money into the pay of struggling local government workers. And we've been running disputes to get the right pay for all sorts of groups. Hundreds of thousands of term time workers who far too often don't get the right pay, the right holiday pay, because schools just don't know how to calculate it. This is worth millions of pounds to those workers, to those classroom assistants, teaching assistants, early years, cleaners and catering staff. We've also put millions of pounds into the pay packets of healthcare assistants by raising disputes over the grade they're on. I won't start explaining the intricacies of the Agenda for Change pay and grading system. I'll just say that for years, they've been do their job has changed dramatically over the years. The responsibilities the co it's are more complex, but the pay and grading system hasn't kept up with it. So this has been a major issue for us. And the day-to-day -day successes like that might not make the headlines. They're not as exciting or newsworthy as strikes. But the important thing about them is they deliver for members. In one hospital in Manchester alone, just a couple of weeks ago, our dispute put £16 million into the pay packets of low-paid workers in one hospital alone. Across the UK, we've won well over £100 million for mainly low-paid healthcare workers in this sector alone. And whilst they may not involve strikes, these successes don't come easily. Each one has to be fought for. That is the power of a union. Because, of course, the struggle is important. It's important to raise awareness, to make the case, to energise and agitate members and working people. But as trade unions, it has to be more than that. We have to make a difference to people's lives. We have to win for our people. And it really feels, I hope you'll agree, that there is a bit of a change in the air at the moment. The recent opinion polls give Labour a huge lead over the Tories, anywhere between 19 and 33 points, something we haven't seen for years. But we are pragmatists in unison. We'll work with any government. In fact, it's in our rule book that we work with governments. But I can see the difference in our relationship with the governments in Scotland and Wales, and even Northern Ireland when they have a government, which isn't very often. We're seen there as part of civil society. We're not seen as the enemy within, as we are by the lot in Downing Street. And during that recent uh, local government pay talks in Scotland that I mentioned, these were held over two very intense weekends. The Scottish Government were in the room. Nicola Sturgeon got personally involved, trying to find a resolution. And I know from talking to him that Mark Drakeford, the Labour First Minister in Wales, would do exactly the same thing. Now, I, and I'm sure none of you could imagine Liz Truss, or any of her cabinet members asking to see the unions to sit down and talk to us. So we will work with any government, but we will also stand up to any government, whether they are blue, whether they are red, or whether they are tartan, if we think they're getting it wrong. And this change in mood can also be seen in the increasing cooperation between unions. Now, I've been a negotiator for over 30 years. We always work with other unions. There's a sometimes an element of competition, but when the chips are down, we work together. But we will see more of that. You know, in the NHS, we coordinate, because we're the biggest NHS union, we coordinate 14 unions in the NHS to try and get a common position. In local government, Unison works closely with the GMB and Unite. In education, we work closely with teaching unions. And at the Trade Union Congress in uh, Brighton in a couple of weeks' time, 
which was postponed because of the Queen's death. My Union and Unite, both of motions calling for greater coordination over industrial action and disputes. <clears throat> now, union membership in general had been going down. It is actually starting to level up and go up a little bit. For us, particularly in Scotland, we've had fantastic results. We've uh, increased about 5,000 members, I think. So uh, we're doing well. And I know other unions are seeing that bounce as well. But it has been, over the years, in decline, which is why it is vital that unions work together, and especially to extend our reach into new and to non-unionised areas. Sectors like hospitality, digital and technical services, as well as the growth areas in the private and voluntary sector, like care and early years. Now, it's tough, and it's not always cost-effective for unions to do this, but I strongly believe there is a moral as well as an economic argument for doing it. And though the media and the right-wing politicians like to portray us uh, as this growing co cooperation as being stoked by what they call the union barons, these stereotypes are well past their sell-by date. What they haven't quite grasped is actually uh, more than half of people who are in a union are in unions led by a woman. <laughs> I think, I, I honestly think they imagine we sit in a war room somewhere where we're directing the strikes, you know, well, Mick Lynch says, oh, well, bring them out there, and, and Sharon Graham says, no, well, now we'll bring them out next week, and I'll say, well, ours are coming out the week after that, uh, and, uh, you know, it's just not like that, because the reality is, it's not trade unions that take strike action, it's working people that take strike action. And it's those same working people who lose out if we don't pick our battles and our strategies wisely. And that does mean working together. We can't allow the right to fall back on discredited economic policies or to push the burden and blame for poverty and low pay onto individuals, always their go-to response. If only you worked harder, had two jobs, work longer hours, or just get a better job, your life would be fine. Even the ludicrous statements we've heard them make about do star jumps in the winter to keep warm, telling pensioners to ride around on buses all day to save on energy costs. I mean, it just beggars belief. You just couldn't make it up. Instead, we in the movement need to keep the focus as Jimmy Reid would have done, on the power of the collective. He raged against alienation caused by capitalism, against a winner-takes-all individualism. And as Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama reminded us, it takes a village to raise a child, and unions are the ultimate collective. Making sure people have enough money to live a decent life is obviously the first step. And Jimmy Reid was adamant that improving people's lives involves more than simply putting money in people's pockets. He said, to measure social progress purely by material advance is not enough. Our aim must be the enrichment of the whole quality of life. And that's our aim too. We don't just focus on improving paying conditions. We focus on giving everyone the chance to fulfil their potential, to be whatever they want to be. Jimmy was an ardent believer in the role of ed that education can play in helping people. And in unison, we've launched the Unison College, guaranteeing access for all our members to advice and support on trade union education, but also critically on professional and personal development. Now, of course, fighting for pay and conditions for our members is our main purpose. But I believe trade unions are also a force for change, including cultural change. That's why fighting equality is so important in trade unions. It's why we constantly focus on ending poverty. But it's also why we look outwards and we campaign and support 
our sister and brother trade unions across the world who are facing oppression. And it's why we take governments to court when they introduce laws that are blatantly unfair, like the tribunal fees law change. And that was a fantastic victory for human rights lawyers, written up, my niece is a lawyer, I'm looking at her, written up in law books, I understand, uh, when Unison won, this, uh, won that case at the Supreme Court. And we've just recently launched a judicial review, and the TUC has done the same, on the Westminster government's proposals to allow employers to bring in agency workers to strike break. That commitment to progress through collective action is why I, and I imagine most people in this room, are or have been trade unionists. That passion and anger against injustice is still for many of us the driving force in our lives. When I'm speaking to a group of activists, I often ask them to remember what it was that made them become an activist in the first place. For some, it was a personal injustice. For others, it was because they saw something happening to a colleague at work, maybe being bullied and harassed, picked on by management, or they tried to get some health and safety issue resolved or they just fought for decent pay and recognition for the jobs they do. And I ask them to always remember the anger and the outrage they felt that drove them to stand up that first time and say, no, I am not accepting that. For me, at the age of 15, listening to Jimmy Reid was just such a moment. I went into that hall, an angry young woman, angry at the injustice and inequality I saw every day, including in my own life. And I left it hungry for the knowledge of how to change things. But then we had left Drum Chapel and I was living with my mother and my older brother in a two bedroom flat, uh, we call, in a multi-story as we called them, um, in Mary Hill. And I shared a bedroom with my mother right up until the day I left home to get married. I wanted a better life, but not at the expense of others. I wanted to change the system that gives some people a huge advantage in life and others a raw deal. And hearing Jimmy Reid speak all those years ago set me on the path that I follow today. It helped me turn my youthful anger into something positive. Like him, I have faith in humanity and an unshakable belief in the transformative power of the collective. Jimmy Reid was a realist, but he never let that realism dampen his optimism, and neither should we. Thank you. Just going to come to that colleague. Um, can you hear me okay using this microphone? Can you hear me at the back okay? Excellent. So an absolutely fantastic contribution from Christina McEnany this evening. I'm sure you'll agree. Christina has very kindly um, agreed to take some questions uh, from the audience and I can see someone um, who's very keen to ask the first <laughs> question uh, coming up. We've got a roving mic um, so it would be helpful if you uh, ask your question into the mic so that the audience can hear that as well and Christina will use this mic in response. Well, can colleagues hear okay at the back? No.
I could feel. Yeah. Thanks for your question, Paula. Thank you. I'm going to take a couple of questions. So if there's a, another question in the room, there's a couple down here. And Billy, there's a couple over here as well. There's a mic there. Hold it up. Oh, okay. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Colleagues, let me take uh, another question. Uh, there's one at the, just here at the front, and, and uh, there's one at the back as well. So we'll take those two, and then I can see other hands up. I'll come to you. Um, Marie, do you want to go first? Thanks, Elaine. Christina, I'm just going And, and then I'll ask Christina to respond. The young man there. Thanks, colleagues. I'm going to ask Christina to respond to those very important questions that you've posed. Sure. Thank you. Um, Angus, I, I couldn't agree more. And one of the key campaigns we've been working on in Unison is on uh, care workers. Uh, we've got 
you know, projects running on it. We're investing like, money, resources, staff time in trying to recruit and organise care workers. It's not easy uh, to recruit in the private and voluntary sector, but it is something that's really important to us. Uh, and we're trying all different kinds of strategies and we're, we're actually doing a kind of, did that work, learn lessons from it, go back out again. Um, but we're also at the same time campaigning with governments across the UK to try and get some structure brought in for care workers. So in, in Wales, we're in very detailed discussions with the Welsh Government about a national care service in Wales. Uh, which is taking shape really well. We're very positive about what it might look like. Um, I'm co-chair of an organisation called the Future Social Care Coalition, which is um, mainly English, but we are trying to widen it out. And it's about trying to bring uh, effect change in the, the English government on paying conditions. So we focused very much on start with the workforce, if you want to improve the care service, start with the workforce and build out from there. I will have to just say a, a, a bit about the Scottish Government's proposals on care, which initially we had been really, really excited about. And, and um, Lillian sat on the group that you were co-chair, weren't you, of the, of the group that, that came up with some of the suggestions. But actually, the way it's panning out, we're not that happy with it because it looks like what's going to happen is... Um, the private and voluntary sector will still have as much of a say in it as they have now. And that's really not what, it's certainly not what our vision or the trade union movement's vision, I think, of, of a national care service was. But, but work is still continuing. We're not giving up hope. And I know that Lily and, and, and colleagues from Unison and other unions are working, trying to sort of influence the Scottish Government to get some change of direction there. Um, Aileen, thank you so much for your kind words. Um, I, I'm honestly, uh, I, I've said this when I was standing um, as General Secretary, I kept referencing, re referencing your father because I genuinely mean that. When I, uh, when I, when I was taken by my, brother, my sister and my brother-in-law, honest to God, it changed my life listening to him. And uh, I've never, ever forgotten. I've never forgotten the feeling I had when I heard him speak. And uh, it's so true what you, you say about becoming visible because... And the thing we have to do is make sure that those people who are the engine of society, who keep things ticking over, who did become visible during the pandemic, are not forgotten. And that's something that we're doing in unison, and I know other unions are working on it too. It's a big issue for us. And I think it's partly why we're doing well in terms of strike ballots at the moment, as people have seen, you know, they, they, they were called upon to go above and beyond. I mean, Things like care workers, taking every other demographic into account, care workers died at twice the rate they should have during the pandemic. I mean, it was one of the worst professions to be in because they were up close and personal with people. They couldn't not turn up to help people. Um, and it's really important that we don't let the world forget that. Um, Marie, fantastic question. And, and strictly for Unison, because as you know, uh, we have a million women members in Unison. We're the biggest women's organisation in the UK by a mile. No other union comes close to us. Uh, and I'm constantly trying to remind the media when they talk about, uh, you know, other little, not little, but, you know, a, little, a campaign group that's set up that talks about women. And I say, do you know what? We have a million pe women who paid money to be a member of our union. I think we can speak on their behalf on some of these issues. But you're right, the big problem we have is how do we engage particularly with low paid workers. So one of the first things I did when I became General Secretary was set up with NEC members. Um, uh, uh, and we're calling it the Member Engagement Programme. I don't want to get into, it's going to sound boring, but I start telling you the intricacies of Unison. But uh, we've got a team of people actually out there working to, to talk to. We've been doing pilot groups with uh, low paid workers in Unison to ask them precisely what it is that stops, what are the barriers to them becoming involved in the union. And the big thing for me is, I don't want to shoehorn shoe them into our structures. I think this could be transformative for our union. And I, I'm sure other unions would uh, may be doing the same thing. I want our union to be something that fits them, not they have to fit into us. And that's a really key thing for us. I, it won't be easy. 
Uh, it won't be something that will happen quickly if we are talking about changing some major parts of our union. But it's a really important project to work on because their voices are just not heard at this point in time. We do have low paid seats on most of our main committees, as you probably know, but they're, they're, uh, we're, I'm not convinced that branches and other regions and other parts of our union, I'm not convinced that we're as good as we could be at reaching out to those, work, to those workers. And it's understandable, people get overwhelmed by the day-to-day -day job of, of being a trade union activist and the caseload and all the, all the stuff you have to do in individual workplaces. So it's a big ask. That's why we are putting resources into working with regions and branches on this really important issue. And um, uh, sorry, I didn't catch your name, but young members. Josh. Uh, do you know, I wish I had a magic button. I wish I, there was some way I could say that we've, we've cracked this. But in actual fact, we recruit reasonably well among young members. We are pretty good at getting them. But, I mean, we can always do better. And again, it's a bit like the women's issue. It's how do we make sure that our structures, that our union is fit for purpose? How do we make the trade union movement, not just, this isn't just about unison, how do you make the, the trade union movement attractive to young people? Um, you know, what, it is, what is it we have to do to make them sit up and think, do you know what, I want to be part of that. And again, that's about listening to young people. So we have our own committee in unison of young members, uh, uh, and we're part of a sort of wider inter uh, UK-wide organisation where we talk to other unions and other young people about what it is that makes a difference to them. Um, I think a big part of it is that many young people start work, as you know, in quite sort of non-unionised sectors, and so there's that big investment in trying to get out and reach them. If they join the public sector, it's a bit easier to go in and find them, and we do a lot of work with students, so it's particularly students I know the teaching unions do loads of fantastic work with, with um, student teachers and we do work with things like student nurses and various other groups but there's always more we could do because you're right, if we don't, you know our demographics are not great, certainly in unison might be different in some other, like teaching unions where you get more young people coming in all the time but our demographics aren't great and so it, that is a huge issue for us in unison. Thanks, Christina, um, some fantastic responses there. A couple of other indications I can see. Stephen, do you want to go ahead at the back? Stephen. Thanks, Stephen. I, I've got a colleague just right in the centre there. I'll take. So I, I, okay. I'm going to take you next, colleague, so I'll get the microphone up to you there. Um, sorry, go ahead.
much, Rosina. Um, can I take a colleague in the middle there? You've got the mic. Thanks very much for that question. Uh, I'm going to ask Christina to respond. There might be time for one last, so have a think about your last <laughs> question. If you still have a burning question you want to ask Christina. Thanks. Um, Stephen, you're right, I should have mentioned more about um, the climate change issues, and actually that's a big issue. It's not just for our young members, but it is a massive issue when we ask young members what it is that makes them want to join, or young people, why, what would make them want to join a union. The green, the climate change is one, and housing are always the two big things that come up, but climate change is, is definitely there. Um, and climate change is intrinsically linked to poverty. There's no doubt about it, because the people who will suffer the most from the worst excesses of climate change across the world, including in our own country, will be, you know, people on low incomes will be the ones that will pay the worst price for it, particularly in, in other parts of the world, but also here. Um, and th it's, it's not something that's going to go away. It's, it's not something that we can just put on one side because we happen to be dealing with another major campaign. Uh, we obviously, and I say this because Stephen's a member of our National Executive Council, so um, we, di we do discuss what our pri priorities will be and where we will put our resources. And you can never put everything into one thing. You're always trying to juggle across the different priorities that we've got. But and in some ways, there are, I'd say there's probably three things that are overarching in almost everything that we do. Uh, one is obviously pay and low pay in particular. The other is our equalities agenda, which we take incredibly seriously. And, uh, and the third one has to be climate change because that affects everybody's life. And we just launched last year as, as well, Stephen was instrumental in this, as um, our own, in Unison's own um, uh, report on what climate change would mean for public services and what they can do about it. And th this isn't something we'll be giving up on because it will have a massive impact, not just on people, but on the services that we all provide and the services that people rely on. And we can see this already in our you know, big public sector employers, that they're, they're struggling with some of the things that we're all struggling with at the moment, including changes in energy. But they are, being able to, for them to become more uh, sustainable and green costs money, as we know. So that's a big part of what we do in Unison as well, is to highlight not just the need to be more aware of the climate and to deal with some of these longer term issues but actually we need the money to go to the big public sector providers and big public sector organisations to make sure they can change their systems so that there isn't the same waste or dependence on things that aren't sustainable in the future. Um, 
Rosina, thank you again for your kind words. And I mean, Rodney Bickerstaff was another huge inspiration. You know, you, you, whatever job you get, you end up standing on the shoulders of giants. And Rodney had huge fights, as you probably know, to get the national minimum wage through the TUC. It was, took years to get it to become trade union congress policy because there was all these opposition. If you, if you have an international minimum wage, you'll upset differentials. You'll upset people who, you know, there was all these arguments. The same as there was, I remember, when I first started, there used to be arguments against uh, equal pay for part-time workers. And that's true. People used to say, you, you can't possibly give part-time workers the same pay as full-time workers. It seems bizarre now. Uh, but the national minimum wage, so our campaign is quite a simple one. Certainly we and I know many other, GMB, Unite and lots of other unions, we're calling for £15 an hour and we don't think that's excessive. I mean, quite frankly, how people are surviving on less than £15 an hour, especially now, is beyond me. Uh, and, uh, you know, I know the impact it's having on our members. I know the call we're getting in unison for people saying they, got their, they want to access the charity that we have, which is called There For You. Uh, and other unions run their own kind of, you know, have their own in-house things that they do. And we're all seeing huge calls on that at the moment. So. Uh, we're working, and that's one of the key things we want to work together on. And as I say, we've been talking. So GMB, Unite, and us, the three big unions of all, and I think I think PCS have, I need to check, double check with PCS, but we're all calling for £15 an hour, and we're all doing our best to work with governments and employers to try and get that brought in. Um, uh, oh, sorry, you mentioned the wages councils, which I think is really important. I'd love to see them come back. And when I was talking about the care sector, the big part of what we're doing, is to, as I said, is to say start with the workforce and actually come up with a structure that says these are the groups of work, this is the, this is the level of, of um, care we want to provide. These are the workers, that, these are the different levels of um, it's skills and experience we need to deliver that. And then you grade them. It's not rocket science, trade unions do it every single day. And what we would like, if we can't get, an, you know, we're still pushing for a national care service, but we want a national pay and grading system as part of that. It's not just about the service, it's about how you, how you deliver it at the staff. <laughs> <clears throat> and so, sorry, I, I didn't, don't think you said your name. Gilbert. Sorry? Gilbert. Gilbert. Um, obviously, I can't comment on individual cases, but uh, I... Certainly trade unions, part of the work that we do, and I, I mentioned it in my speech, was we also ch take legal challenges as well. We do that regularly. We've got all got great camp, uh, policies on trying to change employment legislation in this country, which is very poor. And the big worry for me is the small protections that we have got. Uh, we have a government in Westminster who wants to tear them all up. They want, they're, they're talking about all other protections that we got from uh, the European Union disappearing by the end of the year. Uh, and so that is a massive issue for us. It's a massive, it should be a massive issue for, ev for everyone. Um, so part of what we have to do, I think, is campaign for a change in legislation. We have been campaigning for that, but we need political buy-in for it. It's not something, we as trade unions can't deliver changes in legislation on our own. We need to put pressure on governments to make it happen. Uh, I, I don't know what happened in, in your unions. I know not everyone gets the service they want and not everyone gets the answers they want when things are happening in workplaces and I'm sorry if, if, if you've been, you feel you've been treated badly and the outcome hasn't been good for you um, but you know it's something unfairness still exists in society and we're, we're certainly part of the group I think that's part of that force which is trying to change that fundamental unfairness and give people the right to be able to speak out against that unfairness and take legal cases where they can. Thanks, Christina. Thanks, Christina, for those uh, responses. Colleagues, I raised your expectation about a final question, but unfortunately, <laughs> we have uh, run out of time. I I'm going to ask... Um, Gregor, Professor Gregor Gall to do the vote of thanks, who is the director of the Jimmy Reid Foundation. Gregor, could you uh, give the vote of thanks?
Thank you. Um, it falls to me to first of all give the vote of thanks, but then also make a plea for your further assistance. <laughs> Just let me put this on. That obviously involves money. Um, right, there we are. So, um, the first thanks I need to make are to Glasgow City Council and to the Lord Provost. Thank you very much for the ability to come here for the third year running and have the lecture. We very much appreciate that. Thanks also to the Reid family members for turning up. We very much appreciate their involvement and we're, you know, humbled by the fact that they feel that we are um, worthy of Jimmy's legacy. Um, another thanks, of course, is to you, to you yourselves. We were rather worried about the weather today. Uh, I dodged two bullets today, as in the rain earlier, and I hope that you were able to and you don't get soaked on the way back. So thank you for turning out tonight on quite inclement uh, weather. But the specific thanks I want to give um, are, we haven't, well, the, the Jimmy Reid Foundation has a number of affiliates. There's the EIS uh, Union, the PCS, Unite, UCU and FBU, amongst others. But as you would expect, I particularly want to give thanks to Unison tonight. I want to give thanks to Unison nationally, but also Unison Scotland. Um, the Jimmy Reid Foundation has its office in West Campbell Street, which is the headquarters of Unison Scotland. We are able to use that in the committee rooms, and we are very grateful for that. We are also very grateful for the involvement of Lillian Naser and Stephen Smiley on the boards of the project board of the foundation and also the editorial committee of the magazine. But of course, the biggest thank I want to give tonight is to Christina for coming up back to her hometown, so I hope she enjoys her, her visit, coming up here from London with many other things to do as she outlined in terms of the ballot. And I think without wanting, wanting to be too gushing about it, my recollection of all the previous lectures that have been given by the likes of Jeremy Corbyn, Len McCluskey, Nicola Sturgeon, is that Christina's the only one that not only started off as all the others did with Jimmy, but finished with Jimmy as well, and I think that's very much uh, appreciated. And if I was to sum up what Christina was saying for the, for the main part, she was saying we don't just want bread, we want roses. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> thank you to... <laughs> thank you to the person who I believe, uh, from what you've said, is the first woman General Secretary <laughs> of Unison. <laughs> Okay, so that's the thanks over. Um, I just want to say a few things about the foundation and the work that it does. This magazine, Scottish Left Review, which is on sale outside in the stall, was founded by Jimmy and another um, other colleagues, including Bob Thompson, who's here tonight. It was founded in 2000. It's still going. It's the longest-running Scottish left-wing magazine. Uh, and this issue, fortuitously, the main article is by Tracy Darling, who is the Unison Scottish Secretary. And if I can uh, divulge uh, a confidence, this article was used by Stephen Smiley in the Scottish Parliament a couple of weeks ago. <coughs> uh, Tracy's article is on what the other sources of funding are that the Scottish Government could think about creating, the kind of funding that is needed to fund our public services. So I think that it's great that the article's there, the fact that it's been able to be used in such a way, as I say, it's on sale outside. The other things that the foundation does is to produce uh, publications, pamphlets and books. And our most recent publication, also on sale tonight for the <laughs> price of only £10 when the RRP is 14 is this new book, which covers a whole number of issues, um, including the environment, including education, transport, energy and so on. Uh, and so if you would like to know more about the kind of ideas that are needed to sort out Scotland, make it a fairer place, then I think this is a good place to start. Now it comes to the boring money part. Um, <laughs> yes, we have a lot of support from unions from which we are very grateful. We have become a charity. Uh, we got our charitable status last year. We started operating as a charity on the 1st of April this year. And we do ask for your charity, as in there's going to be a collection uh, as you leave the, the hall tonight. But it's not just charity we're asking for. We're asking for your solidarity. We're asking for your solidarity to continue our work for the kind of things that we think that you will support and believe uh, and, and will find helpful. And when you go out tonight, it would be good if you can put some money in the boxes, but it would also be good if you would consider becoming sustaining members of the foundation and possibly also give a, a, a donation. So I think it's also appropriate that in addition to another book that Christina is getting tonight, I'll give her this one. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Me, uh, colleagues, to 
just to close the lecture and before I do so again a huge thanks for everyone turning out tonight particular thanks as, as we've said to the Reid family but also to Christina's family <laughs> for the support that they have shown Christina through uh, the years of her activity and I know that many trade unionists in here could not do the job that we do without that support from our family so thank you to Christina's family for that. token of appreciation for Christina <laughs> thank you. from the um, foundation and um, just to thank you Christina oh, thank for your you. contribution, another book, <laughs> pamphlet um, and, and to thank you all and, and to wish you all a very safe onward journey. Thanks again for your support.